So again, welcome everybody. I am Arn van Alsterfeer. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the Consortium for Service Innovation. And I, I head up the training and certification arm of the consortium. And for today's KCS in Action, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Kendall Bernaisi and uh, Dave Thomas from M5. And Kendall is the Senior Manager of Digital Services, and Dave is also a Senior Manager of Digital Services. And uh, many companies struggle with getting sufficient resources for their KCS uh, coaching program. I'm sure some of you on the call can relate to that. And Kendall and Dave are going to share how they sold F5 leadership on uh, the need for coaching, and we'll also share the tremendous benefits that they've realized. But some housekeeping before we begin, this session is being recorded and will be posted on the consortium site as well as sent out to all of registered. And we're also gonna be providing the presentation when we send out the recording. And uh, during this, if you could please put yourself on mute and um, please post your questions in chat. So we have many representatives from F5 that are gonna be monitoring the chat and we'll either answer them in the chat bring them up as appropriate to Kendall and Dave in the flow, or save them for the Q&A session at the end. And the, in, in the event that we can't cover all the chat questions in this session, F5 has graciously agreed to answer them shortly after the session. And we're also gonna be sending that final chat transcript uh, in, those, in that email to all who have registered. But we want to also make sure you are aware of upcoming case yes, consortium events. Um, we have our signature event of the year coming up in March in San Diego. And while we call it the Member Summit, non-members are very welcome to attend also. And we'll have many great sessions from practitioners and leaders, and certainly coaching will be one of those topics. And we'll host many open space sessions uh, also where the participants can bring up topics they'd like to discuss. And there's going to be also many opportunities to make lasting connections with your peers. So we encourage you to attend that if you can make it. And we also have two KCS in Action sessions um, coming up. Jorge Carrasco from Quest will be discussing Quest Social KDE program, and that's uh, the Knowledge Domain um, Engineer program. Um, Jorge uh, presented a couple of years ago on this very topic and was very well received. And uh, Quest has had many improvements to the program since then, so we synced up and we're pleased to have him back again. And in April, we have our popular KCS roundtables. So we give you the opportunity to ask questions from experienced practitioners on a variety of topics, including um, getting started on your KCS journey, launching and sustaining a KCS uh, coaching program, um, maximizing KCS with an effective knowledge domain analysis program, and many others. And Jennifer Morcat, our community success manager, will be posting a link to all those events in the chat. But I'm very excited about today's event and please pass it over to Kendall and Dave. Yeah, good morning, everybody. And thanks for, for coming. Um, quick little intro about uh, Dave and I. Um, Dave, you want to uh, jump right on in and we'll get started since we got a lot to cover today. Uh, yeah, it's uh, nice to meet everybody. I'm Dave, uh, as you can tell from my picture, which was taken the year I started at F5. I've uh, grown some gray since then. Uh, but yeah, I've been here uh, nine years. I've been uh, with the digital services and, and several former names of our org uh, for coming up on seven years and uh, was part of the initial group of folks uh, with Kendall who got uh, uh, wind of the this change to our support org that was coming and we got uh, certified it as uh, KCS V6 practitioners and uh, the rest is sort of history. And you'll hear a lot of that history today. Yeah, and uh, I also have been with F5 for a bit and um, grown at uh, as a KCS practitioner over the years. And I'm privileged to lead a team, team of program experts and program managers within our digital programs, our digital teams. And uh, over the years, I've picked up a couple of certifications that the consortium offers and uh, have loved every minute of it. A little, bit of, a little bit about us, but let's get into the actual meat and potatoes of our conversation today. So when, um, when we think about our journey at F5, uh, we thought it'd be beneficial to tell you all a little bit about who F5 is and the scope of our KCS program so that you can understand a little bit about how it relates to our coaching program. Then we're going to kind of go into the, the journey of 
how did we get to the realization that we needed a coaching program? How did we get to the realization that it was going to bring us to the next level of our KCS success? And we're also going to spend some time talking about how did we measure the ROI and sell those benefits to our leadership today? And if time's permitting, which I have a hunch it probably won't be, but we'll see, um, we'll go into how we're leveraging coaching as a cornerstone for innovation for a lot of other initiatives and things we're doing at F5. But before we get into all that, for those of you who haven't heard of F5, you might be wondering who in the world are we? Well, at F5, we are a at our core a technology company, and we believe that applications that we all use today are critical for everyday life. They make up how we eat, how we get around and navigate the world, how we socialize, how we work, considering we're literally doing that right now, how we pay for things, and even how we kick our feet up at the end of the day and relax. So while we are a technology company, we're really a company for helping people thrive, for helping people grow and enjoy their lives in a better way. And the ways in which we do that is we offer a slew of uh, features and products within our portfolio suite that enable automation, security, performance, um, and a ton of insights into what the networks of your customer or our customer base are doing. And at our core, we deliver these applications and secure them so that you all get to live, breathe, eat, navigate, pay for things, et cetera, in a way that gives you reprieve from the stresses of all the technology that's going on behind the scenes. At the end of the day, our goal, our vision is to make the, a better digital world to our lives. Now, within that F5 enterprise, we, uh, Dave and I are from a team called Digital Services. And our goal, the way we roll up to that strategy, is our primary vision is to be able to make it easier for people to find answers by giving them a personalized digital experience. Now, within this digital services team that we're talking about, we're spread out across the globe. We're a small but mighty team of 40, and we have specialties in everything from program management to data science to internal and external communications with our customers to product readiness and one of our most known is letting the industry know about security issues, um, whether it be in our product or in third-party products. But now let's spend a couple of minutes talking about our journey to get involved in coaching. So this whole KCS and coaching journey started way back in 2015. And in 2014, 2015, there were whispers and kind of ideas of the idea of KCS floating around our support org. Um, and it really started to begin with this new project. And this new project was to migrate to a new knowledge base and stand up a new uh, public website. And we started doing that in 2015. And by the time 2016 rolled around, we had our first published article. Um, that's In fact, the article is the one on the left-hand side. And the email that you see on the right-hand side was RVP praising the individual for our first published article. Now, to be completely clear, this wasn't exactly what I would call KCS. In fact, I would go so far as to say is it was not KCS. It was this idea of KCS light. And we did see some small wins and some small successes, but we were still struggling and kind of starting to try to find our feet along the way. We also hired a new member of the team, Adam Hansen, who many of you on this call have probably interacted with over the years, and he was an incredible value add to our org. Then by the time yeah. 20... Yeah, Dave, go for it. I'm just going to jump in real quick. You said something that I think uh, is very interesting, and a lot of people might resonate with this. Yeah. The concept of KCS Lite. Way back in 2016, KCS was a scary term to float around uh, in our support work. It there was not much known about it, and it you know, and and some of you, some of you folks may have experienced this as well. It at first glance, it seemed a lot of questions we would get about it were to the effect of, isn't this just teaching something, somebody else to do my job? Or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's the point of a support engineer if customers are, are just going to self solve everything? And so there was a little bit of fear around that. And so there was, we, we, so we took, we had several different iterations of our version of KCS before we really were able to drive the point home that there's, there isn't really a, a different version of KCS. There's you either, you're either doing KCS or you're not doing KCS. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
And that you're going to see start to stem out of the rest of the journey up until present day, because it was in 2017 that we actually took the KCS V6 practices course, as well as the KCS coaching class. And during that year, we learned a ton about how do we actually begin to roll this concept of KCS out. And then in 2018, we refreshed our KCS program. I'll, I'll say refresh as opposed to reboot, because we realized that our KCS wasn't really KCS. It was, it was a heavy weighted process. It was a heavy weighted content standard and a, and a slew of other things that were in our way. We also got a little bit more experience, a little bit more knowledge and attended the KCS world tour in Seattle. And in fact, um, we then wrote the book, if you will, on the things not to do um, and did a KCS New Year's resolutions presentation a while back as well. In fact, if you dig through the archives, I bet you might even be able to find it. We got KCS practices certified in 2018 and hired a, a handful of more folks between Jason Rowland, Daniel Chan, and Gowry Padrisi. And then in 2019 is when things really started to gain momentum. 2019 was a big year of change for us. It was the year where we actually had our first independently published article. So earlier when I mentioned published, um, that was published by a secondary knowledge engineer tech writing team, but it stemmed from our support organization. Whereas in 2019, we had a support engineer get the privilege of actually clicking the publish button independently all on their own. We also combined our legacy experience and compliance-based teams, and that is what you know as today as digital services, the team Dave, myself, Laurel, and many other F5ers on this call represent. We also overhauled our workflow significantly. We cut our knowledge licensing in half. We cut our uh, article statuses in half. We had a lot of legacy ones from an old way of working. We then gained some KCS practices trainers, um, took another round of coach training with Beth Haggett. Hi, Beth, by the way. Thanks for kicking off a lot of this fire that we have talking about that we're going to spend some digging into the data today. And the legendary Laurel Portner joined F5 back then as our director. And then we also had Andy Koopmans, Tom Marchant, and Kurt Erickson join the team for focusing on program of KCS. In 2020, we got wise and we hired a data analyst by the name of Manas Tripathi. And much of the data you're going to see in a little bit can be traced back to a shift towards adding data intelligence into the digital services organization. And in many ways, the relationship that Dave and I have between program experts and data experts is the thing that's made this all a success. And several of you might have even have attended a call that we did back in 2020, where we demoed our coaching tool that we built in-house. Um, and uh, there was lots of salivation over that tool. And uh, I'm pleased to say that we're now working on a next generation of it um, to be released shortly. The other thing that I would be remiss if I didn't highlight is in 20. The, the shoulder between 2019 and 2020 is when we started our coaching program. And we're going to get into a little bit how and why we started it. But that is the time frame in which in our KCS journey, coaching came to F5. And as a result of that, in 2021, we started to actively monitor things like the license progression of our organization, candidate contributor publisher, as well as the speed in which content was getting created versus exposed to customers. We added a couple more members of our team with Fernando and Nick and, and Mega in 2022. And we were also privileged to contribute to the consortium in a couple other ways, one of which we helped facilitate a conversation on what does it look like to coach in a mature KCS environment, as well as um, one of my personal favorites was a, a collaboration with a, several members of all the folks on this call to write the field guide for KCS program management. Now, today, we're now pleased to report that we're, we've migrated over to Salesforce Knowledge and we are live with a new Maya 5 portal. And that leads us all the way to where we are with you right now. So Dave, do you want to touch a little bit about in 2023, what the scope and size of our KCS and coaching program looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you can see, I won't read everything on the left, but uh, you know, we're about 7,500 employees globally. Uh, uh, you know, only, a, only, a, you know, uh, five or 600 uh, knowledge workers, uh, folks participating in the KCS program. Um, and we have about 40,000 or so articles live today. Those I, I would be venturing a guess. I think we're around seven 
to 8,000 of those articles are, uh, have stemmed from the KCS program. But that is our, that is the lifetime of our uh, knowledge base going back to, uh, well, Tom is on and Tom knows how long it, it's gone back. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, over 20 years, we've had uh, uh, this knowledge base. Um, so you can see just in the last few years, adding roughly 7,000 to that, uh, that's a, uh, that's a pretty big impact uh, over the life, just the span of our KCS program to date, uh, how much we've been able to add to the knowledge base. Um, we have about 130,000 cases opened per year um, and uh, just over 5 million annual visits to our uh, support portal. Um, yeah, and um, all of that you might be wondering now, how in the heck did we get so many coaches with 77 active coaches um, present day? How did we get them engaged? How did we get leadership to buy off on it? And the technique we used was actually kind of a, a working session, a mind map, if you will. And what we realized is the, the goals and the initiatives that were set before us was make KCS succeed, enable KCS to thrive. And then we started to really ponder the question, well, how do we get ourselves to the, there? To do that, we realized we started to have to ask ourselves, how do we define KCS success for F5, for, for our organization? And what we did is we pulled a handful of our program experts into a room and started to ponder that question. How, what is the ROI of KCS? What is the ROI of coaching? What, what are we really trying to strive for? And what we realized is at the end of the day, we were looking to try to create advocates. Advocates internally from within our employee base, as well as advocates externally with our customer base. So then we spent a couple of days, and I'm going to make this look probably much simpler than it was in real life here in a moment, but we spent a couple of days mind mapping and tracing back from the goal or the outcome we wish to achieve, and then working backwards into what activities can we put in place, what, what initiatives can we put in place to try to help move the needle of success. And as we started to do that, we realized that a couple of things started to stand out to us. We were aligning to two of our very own goals and values as an F5 company, one of which is we help each other thrive. That's a goal, a, a vision that we live and breathe, as well as to our external value is we obsess over customer needs. And we realized that we were building a strategic framework. Frankly, we were just doing it in a visual format. And we also recognized that KCS was one of the things that could help us create those advocates. But then we were kind of stumped again. We were like, but wait a minute, we still need to figure out how do we help KCS succeed then? So then we started to look more into our practices of KCS and our, and our processes and realized that, well, to get the outcome internally we wanted, we wanted to enable support staff to be able to reuse knowledge. To get the outcome we wanted for customers, we wanted to enable our customers to reuse knowledge. And the way we did that for customers was to publish more content that's quality and relevant to them. And of course, how do you get more reuse? You got to create, right? This is the KCS solve loop, essentially just in a different visual. Um, and we noticed that we, of course, needed more publishers. We needed more people to be able to publish internally and externally. And then we started pondering a little bit of a tougher question. We realized that within the KCS practices, the evolve loop talks a lot about leadership and communication and its um, uh, initiative being to drive the solve loop, to enable the solve loop. But we had a big question mark there. We, we realized that our leaders necessarily weren't KCS experts. Some of them had seen KCS at former companies, former organizations, but hadn't necessarily lived and breathed the life of a knowledge worker in several years. And we realized that there was a gap to fill. And in talking with several members of the consortium, um, as well as Beth, we realized that coaching was the thing that we needed to fill that gap. So when we went to sell this to our leadership, we did some of these exact same slides just in a very, very older format that you're seeing here today, because we realized and they realized that there was a challenge. There was a problem we needed to solve for. That was that question mark. And we realized that coaching was one of the things we could do to enable it. And after that, when our leadership bought off on it and said, okay, we'll give you some time to test this theory. We'll give you some, some resources to test it. And we asked for a few extra, of course, like any good program manager, you ask for the stars and you settle for the moon. We asked for six coaches to start out of the 550 knowledge workers you mentioned earlier, Dave. 
And those six were a, a small but mighty group that we tested in the um, late 2019 and into 2020. We also asked to change some metrics. We put a goal on coaching and the goal was simple. Meet with your coach regularly, consistently. And we've got some data in a moment that we'll talk about on how we measure that. But the goal achieved, or I should say gained an MBO, a bonus structure, if you will, that says, hey, if you meet with your coach consistently, we'll give you an extra. And we knew that that was an activity-based metric. We knew that that was an activity-based goal. However, we had a theory that it would get us closer to the outcomes we were wishing to achieve. And we'll talk about those outcomes here in a moment. Dave's got a ton of data on that for us. We also got our coaches formally trained by Dr. Beth Haggett, uh, as well as started to build some in-house tool-specific coach training. How to use that coaching tool we were talking about earlier, which that's a screenshot from the demo, by the way. I saw the, the question in the chat from Bill. Thanks, Kelly, for, um, for getting the link to that recording. As well as we got our coaches equipped, not just in coaching, but highly equipped in KCS. So by many rights, these, these small but mighty few in the very beginning became our KCS um, experts as well as our coaching experts. Another resource that we stood up was a weekly coaching calibration for all three regions, North America, Europe, uh, EMEA, as well as APCJ, where all the coaches get together. There's typically a program manager in the room just to kind of help facilitate um, the conversation, ask questions, but it's really the coaches who get to own this conversation. And then we also integrated content center checklist and process adherence review directly into our coaching tool. Um, and then that tool became lovingly known as the grow tool, because at the end of the day, the core of what we were trying to do with our coaching program was grow people. So that's a little bit about how we sold it. Now, let's be honest, though, selling something requires a way to prove its value. And so to be honest with you, we had to go a little bit on faith that our coaching program was going to succeed. But I'm pleased to say today we are going to start to dig into the data on how do we measure its benefits. And Dave's going to start to sink our teeth into that right now. Uh, yes. Uh, so just as, just to start out, this is a, this is a high level look at our, our overall demand for, uh, for digital service. Um, and so that uh, includes visits to our web portal, and you can see that uh, increasing over the years, as well as our, our high level self service success measurement, which is uh, uh, a metric we call article exit, means a, a, a user came to our site. Uh, and the last thing they did before they left was uh, read a knowledge article. So they ended their visit on a knowledge article. They did not go open a case. They didn't go on to use some other part of the site. So, and again, that's very high level. That's not to say every one of those was going to become a case, uh, but that's, um, again, that's what we call self-service success. And, uh, and then our case volume doesn't look as good as I wanted it to because of the scale here, but you can see from those numbers, uh, other than a couple quarters where we uh, had some uh, really exciting uh, vulnerabilities to deal with, we uh, our case volume has uh, by and large started to tick down over time. So we're seeing our, our visits and our successful visits going up and we're seeing the number of cases being opened going down and we'll dig into a little bit of that in these next few slides. So first, uh, KCS activities, search link create. Uh, if you've been doing KCS long, you're probably very familiar with that refrain, search link create, search link create. These are the activities that, uh, you know, uh, are, are really the bread and butter of uh, the KCS program. Search early, search often, capture in the flow, reuse that content and create when there is no content. So, um, the next few slides are all going to be based off of two full years worth of data from the, for FY21 and all of FY22. And so, uh, and when we'll look at it uh, similarly is folks who are coaches, folks who are uh, learners, and then folks who are neither, uh, who are in our, uh, in our support org working cases, but they are not participating in the coaching program. So we can see, we're gonna look at the metrics for these folks uh, based off of these different categories. So um, right out of the gate, we can see 
folks who coach, uh, search, link, and create at, uh, at a higher rate than learners themselves. Uh, by the way, coaches are very often also learners. And so those, those metrics do include uh, folks who coach and learn on the learner side. Uh, and then those not, not participating, you can see they're searching, linking, and creating with a lot less frequency. In terms of KCS proficiency, if you remember back to the um, that life cycle slide that Kendall was showing uh, uh, about our KCS journey and and uh, uh, our KCS success journey, uh, proficiency is a, a big part of it. License advancement, and uh, I think we have just just shy of sixty five percent of all of our. Uh, KCS practitioners have an advanced license, meaning they've advanced beyond uh, candidate. And if we look at that broken down by folks' uh, participation in the coaching program, uh, you'll see that uh, the, the vast majority of those folks who have not uh, advanced uh, are folks who are not participating in the coaching program. So we see license advancement uh, really come into play here with uh, our coaching program. And Kendall, anything you want to add on the left-hand side? Yeah, I, th I thought that we might have a handful of folks here on the call that um, that are new to KCS and maybe don't necessarily understand the terminology of candidate, contributor, and publisher. Um, so we weren't going to spend a whole lot of time on those definitions, but the left-hand side is essentially the definition of what they can or can't do within the tool stack of our KCS program at F5. So. But yeah, we've started to notice in a, in a very large way as we've trended over time, the more coaching that occurs, license advancement accelerates. Um, again, to Dave's point, 2% of our organization who's not engaged in coaching um, is publisher and the majority of them are candidates today. Let's, so that, oh, go ahead, Dave. So that, so that, that talks a little bit about the, the impact of, of coaching within the coaching program within the KCS program. But let's jump to the next slide and let's see how the coaching program impacts uh, a, a metric that is not particular to a KCS shop. Uh, time to close. The average number of days it takes to close a case. And, and so we have been tracking over the last couple of years uh, data around coaching interactions and time to close. And so the the Data set behind this is uh, looking at whether, when a case is closed, whether or not a coaching interaction has been recorded for the person who closed that case. And, and, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Kendall, that's as a learner, right? That's not even, that's not, that's not even taking into account the, the coaches themselves. But yeah. so we're, we can see over time our, the, the delta between our, uh, Folks who participate in the coaching program and those who don't are actually that that number is that gap is growing and we're seeing we're seeing folks who are participating in coaching closing actually closing cases at a higher rate uh, or, or faster than their counterparts who, who are unengaged in, in the coaching program. So in many ways, what you'll start to notice is this is coaching's impact on the internal ROI. This at this point, we're not even looking at KCS data. This is just simply independent of KCS. And that's something we thought we'd spend a moment to call out as well is that while yes, our KCS program and our coaching program are tied at the hip, they're very, very highly intertwined. Um, they're also independent. We operate them as independent programs um, because there is a Venn diagram, if you will, of relationship between them, but they also can stand on their own two feet. Now, this time that we've done or time that we've invested into our coaching program um, was an interesting uh, data point when we started to look at the data that Dave was just talking about around time to closure. And over the last two years, if we were to add up the total number of um, coaching sessions that were hosted, it equals 6,685 sessions out of a possible 51,000. And you might be wondering, where do I get that 51,000 from? And that 51,000 is the total number of coaches and learners per week, because we offer uh, coaching on a per week basis. But of course, 
schedules get uh, a little bit hairy, curveballs come up, that kind of thing. So in total, we've seen our coaching organization, our coaching program implement 6,685 sessions. The max volume of those sessions is, is typically an hour. Okay. And that hour data point is going to make sense here in just a moment. But if we take that total number of hours between coach and learner, that means we have to double the 6,000. Okay. But we also offer for our coaches another hour, every single learner or coachy that they have to be able to spend some time analyzing the, the person that they're coaching their data. So the content center checklist of the articles they've written process adherence review for the, for the reuse and improve opportunities that they may or may not have taken advantage of. So in total, it means that we've spent, we've invested 20,055 hours over the last two years from our coaches, from our program. If we divide that number by 24 to convert that into days, it's the equivalent to 836 days invested into our coaching program. But we also have to consider that not only is the, are the coaches getting invested by the, the sessions they're hosting, as well as the anal analysis they're doing, but they also have that weekly calibration call that I mentioned a moment ago. Well, if we take the 90 coaches, multiply by 52 weeks times two years, that's another 390 days in total investment. So grand total, it means that we've invested 1,226 days into our coaching program, okay? Days of time, of human capital, of, of resource. However, as Dave pointed out, there's a whole slew of time saved in there. So if y'all are interested, that whole green section that I just highlighted on the screen here, I'd be curious to know, feel free to put your guesses in the chat, how many days we've calculated that we've saved the business just from the tracing back of the data of the people who have a coach. So I'll give you all maybe 30 seconds to put your guesses in the chat on how many days we've saved. And while you're, while you're coming up with your guesses, I'm going to point out one thing, the very beginning of this slide, uh, all the way back in Q1 of 2021, you'll notice that, uh, those with coaching interactions were closing cases at a, at a slower rate than folks who had had a coaching react or, or who hadn't had a coaching interaction. And uh, we often term uh, things like this as swallowing the fish. Mm -hmm. um, what are, you know, it, what do we have to invest and what is that going to cost us in real terms? And, and the big fear with coaching is obviously, and I've seen a couple in the chat already is the time it takes out of casework to, uh, not only engage in, in KCS activities, but, but certainly to, uh, uh, to spend time coaching or learning. It's often seen as a detractor from, the, you know, those traditional support metrics. And you also might remember a moment ago, I said that we kind of had to start on a little bit of faith because obviously leadership's looking for raw data if they can, right? Prove it, prove that it's beneficial. And I'll be pleased to share with you now with a handful of guesses in the chat that in grand total, if we add up the 130,000 cases over the course of two years and extrapolate that out in the time saved per case, it's the equivalent to 264,000 days of time saved to the business at F5. Now, you might be wondering, that's a really, really massive number. And we'll admit it is. But just for context, if we were to extrapolate out the total number of days of work F5 has inside of F5 support, it's 5.2 million days. So just for some context, it it's, takes 5.2 million days of work over the last two years for us to work with customers via cases, but coaching has impacted the business by 264,000 days. That's just coaching and case management, but let's talk about the relationship between coaching and KCS. Dave, back to you. Yeah. So in order for customers to self-solve, we've got to have content which means we've got to get articles published. Uh, and so this first, uh, the first graph here on the top, this is the average number of articles published per engineer in that category. So as you can see, folks who are coaches uh, publish an average of 34 articles per coach, 10 for learners and uh, two for folks who are not participating in the coaching program. 
So once that content is created and it's available, we, we, uh, we, need, we need KCS to help us solve our, our issues faster. Uh, so which means close cases faster, right? Which means reuse knowledge. And uh, if you look at the line in the middle or the graph in the middle, this is links or knowledge reuse events, uh, a, a support engineer linking an article as a resolution to a case uh, per article published. So the, if you're a coach, you're getting an average of eight links uh, or eight reuse events per article published seven for learners, and it drops down to three for uh, folks not participating in the coaching program. And so that, that, can, be, that can be viewed as the perceived uh, value of that content internally uh, by your colleagues. Are, are, are your colleagues finding this valuable? Are, you, are they reusing it to uh, uh, make their job more efficient? Um, and then lastly, we go back to... Uh, that high level self-service success, success metric of article exit. And uh, if you're a coach, you've got an average of 310 article exits or self-service success events per article published. Uh, learners, that uh, goes down to two, two, what is that, 286. And if you're not participating, the, that goes all the way down to 80. And so this can be really, really looked at as the perceived value of this content by the customer. And so uh, if you're creating the content, your colleagues are reusing it and the customers are finding value in it and ending their session, we've got, we've got three big data points there to share uh, for the ROI. Absolutely. So we go back and look at that a couple slides ago, we showed our, you know, in terms of raw numbers, we showed our visits and our self-service success uh, and our cases. And you might've noticed our, the visits and self-service success events sort of mirror each other at that scale. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell the difference, but when you uh, really dig down into it and here we're looking at the percentage of article exit per uh, for our visits each quarter. And so you can see now it's, it's more incremental, but you can see that percentage more and more uh, as we go, as our KCS program has evolved and as our coaching program has evolved, we're seeing a higher percentage of customers ending on a self-service article. If you think about that, um... 88% of our self-service success we can trace back to coaching just for the sake of visualization. That's a little bit about what that looks like right there. But roughly ballparking about 88%, 90% of, of self-service success. We can trace back to those actively engaged coaches within our program. And here, here's another way, uh, you know, when you're looking at selling the ROI, you really have to think in terms of support leadership. What, what language do support leaders speak? And, and, and when we're talking about metrics, traditional metrics uh, it apply. And so it's, it's a much easier conversation if you, if you can apply uh, the KCS activities and, and the, uh, um, the effect of those activities on the support org to metrics that they're already familiar with. And so, uh, case volume is is something that every support manager uh, knows very well, and so this uh, graph here is showing the ratio of self service success events to uh, cases opened, and so you can see again over time as our as our uh, percentage of self service success goes up and our cases steadily tick down. You, you see more and more uh, th that number that number grows in terms of self service success to cases open uh, with the uh, that drop in Q four like every every company the uh, there are always you know bumps in the road and uh, that can 
I think a large part of that drop can be attributed to our uh, migration that we went through last quarter. Absolutely. So that's a bit of the, the data that we've captured today at F5 around how coaching is impacting both our KCS program and also the way people show up to work, their effectiveness, their efficiently, efficiency, and also kind of a little bit of their hearts and minds. A couple other unmentionables that I think we'd call out here as well is when we started to sit down and start to uh, calculate this data and, and start to understand how it's impacting our org, one of the other variables that we noticed is that we thought we'd call out for all of you is that tenure can be a very, very large variable in the success of your KCS or your coaching programs. Um, and while we're not going to show the data today per se, we did include it in the in the slides in the appendix. So after this call, we're, we're going to offer the consortium to, to have access to these slides. But um, you'll start to notice that much like us, um, the newer tenured people were very proactive. Yes, I want to coach because a lot of times you're drinking from the fire hose anytime you start with a new company or a new org or a new role. Whereas the much higher tenured people within our organization maybe didn't necessarily see what was in it for them per se. And, and that's true for us as well. And it's something that we're actively trying to, to change the culture and the mindset of. So don't forget about tenure and its relationship to coaching and KCS as you're, as you're developing your programs. The other mentionable that we thought we'd call out as well that we're super excited and, and proud of is that um, that this data that we're sharing with you today um, is, is I would argue now in many respects, best practices for, for coach trainers to teach. And in fact, the slide you see embedded here on the right is um, directly out uh, a contribution that we've given back to the coaching methodology that Dr. Beth has, has dispersed across the organization and of KCS practitioners. And the third bullet, and hopefully this is all resonating with you by now, and I've said this once, but I'll say it again, is that much of the success of both our KCS and our coaching programs stems from the relationship that the programs ma uh, managers and our data experts have. Um, so like Dave and I said earlier, we're both privileged to lead a team of program experts and data experts and getting them in the room and engaging and talking with each other and brainstorming about what if, could we measure this? Could, would this be good to measure? And kind of debating over those topics has given us the insights that we have that we're able to share with you today. And lastly, we're not done yet, right? We've got a long journey still ahead of us and a lot of goals going forward. So for those of you who might be wondering, well, that's all well and good. Where are you going next with your coaching program and your methodology? Um, and in many respects, we are now leveraging coaching to help the organization change and grow. In fact, uh, Alina Weber, our change management program manager is on the call with us today. And, and we're now much like the coaching and the data relationship, we're also connecting coaches to change because in many respects, KCS is a change initiative and coaches help people grow and adopt new ways of working and change. We've also seen an enterprise wide coaching program stand up within F5. And it was really, really exciting and cool to see that before this got stood up, they came to us, the, the program manager for this enterprise-wide coaching program came to us and said, hey, we've heard about your coaching program. We've heard a little bit about the way you measure it in the data. Tell us a little bit about it. What are you getting out of it? And that was fuel that that program manager was able to use to go to our leadership and say, hey, we want all people leaders across F5 to be able to get a coach themselves. So as we mentioned earlier on the call, Dave and I are both alumni of that program. Um, we've both been able to receive a coach for ourselves as leaders of teams, and that was an incredibly valuable resource. So now there's an enterprise-wide version of it, not just one specifically in the organization of knowledge workers we have. In addition, I mentioned earlier that there are no less than four parallel KCS programs at F5 to include in our IT help desk teams, um, our HR team, and, and a couple others that are parallel products. Um, those startups, if you will, those KCS startups are getting coached by many of our lead coaches inside of our organization. So it's to help their KCS program and their coaching programs thrive as well. And now more recently, and a little bit more bleeding edge, we're also seeing many of our coaches become emerging leaders within the organization. Um, anecdotally, there's a faster rate of career growth and career progression for many of these coaches, because of course, not only are they subject matter experts on our customers, our tools, our technology, our products, our processes, but they also start to adopt many of the five coaching skills that are critical for them to be able to connect with people and help those people grow. 
And as we start to stand up additional programs like our KDA program and intelligence swarming, and also we are, uh, as a security company, we're heavily in a compliance-based security-minded organization, we are starting to leverage coaches to help push the envelope of these new programs. So because at the end of the day, we want to continuously work our way up that stack that you see in the graph on the right. But, and with that, since um, we do have some, oh, go ahead, Dave. One more. I want yeah, to please. go back to change management as a, mm. a, a critical piece of uh, your KCS journey. And uh, this is from, from my perspective on our KCS program, the culture change that goes along with with uh, transforming from a traditional support org into a KCS uh, support org is, uh, is, a, is a massive challenge. And uh, F5 is, is uh, we've, people love working at F5. And uh, I've always been impressed at the, at the tenure of people at F5. Uh, in fact, the fact that I've been here nine years still blows my mind. I never had a job more than three years uh, prior to coming to F5. Um, so uh, that being said, that means there's a lot of folks who've been here a long time. And the, and you'll see in the uh, the appendix data, if you come look at the this slide deck uh, after it's shared, you're going to see a slide on tenure in there. And you're going to notice that folks who have more tenure are less likely to uh, be engaged or, or at least for us, have been less likely to be engaged in our coaching program. And so making that, uh, uh, having that realization earlier on in our journey, I think could have helped us, uh, could, have, could, have, could have helped us uh, grow and scale faster and, and increase our adoption. Um, and it's something that you may want to think about uh, if, depending on where you are in your journey, is how do we engage those uh, longer tenured individuals that tend to be mentors, tend to get looked up to, and, and tend to be those folks that if you can uh, convince them, sell them on the ROI, or as Kendall called it, the what's in it for me, uh, and, and get them to be early adopters, that that's just going to add to your... Uh, ability to scale a program like a KCS program. So absolutely. Absolutely. And we weren't sure we were going to have time to, to show you all this, but one of the other techniques that, uh, that we use to get this coaching program off the ground that I actually think is, is relevant to share with you all. So I'll actually start to play this video here in just a moment, but was we started to, um, interview people who were being coached after three months, six months, et cetera. And we interviewed them in short little interviews and then sliced them down to, you know, five minutes instead of being 20 minutes. Um, but we asked them some questions about, Hey, what do you think of your coach? What do you think of your coaching time? Is your manager committed to it? Things like that. And those, um, uh, uh, screenshots of some of those uh, learners or co coaches are from them. And then we use those videos and market it out to the organization. We sent them out via email um, marketing campaigns, SharePoint marketing campaigns, et cetera, in order to see if we could drum up more excitement for getting a coach. And it worked. And then this video that I'll play with you here for just a moment here is actually an interview from our coaches themselves. Let me fix my screen share to share sound. This is about three minutes long, four minutes long, if I remember correctly. Let me see if I can make this play. Can y'all hear the audio? Yes. yes. Yeah, we can hear it great. I was figuring out uh, uh, my workflow as a coach and how it works best for me. The time thing was a, a challenge, but it got easier as I figured out a workflow that these things could sit in, you know, uh, how I overcome that challenge was lots of communication and lots of planning for uh, the time that it would take to go through these coaching sessions. If I felt like it was going to take a half an hour, I try and schedule an hour mm -hmm. uh, and then push that out and, and work with my coachee for what time's going to work best for them and kind of let them manage the time schedule. 
uh, I was kind of worried that managers uh, weren't going to uh, want to allocate the time or my coaches weren't going to have the time to be available. But every conversation with manager that I've had, uh, NSE manager, ENI manager, uh, they all are 100% advocating for KCS and the coaching program specifically. And so they're not nearly as worried about the time as I was. One of the neat things that coaching is doing is it's helping us um, figure out ways to incorporate the SKD portion into our normal workflow. The one thing that I found is prior to coaching, so with a new engineer that doesn't know what coaching is, they have a tendency to walk in doing this. What is this about and what are you doing for me? And by the end of the first session and maybe the beginning of the second one, they're suddenly like, you're here to help me. That's really cool. I want to do this. As a coach, mm -hmm. um, I am definitely sensing recognition of how easy it actually is to do the work, how effective it can be when it's, when it's incorporated into your day-to-day -day workflow. Um, and I've seen individuals support engineers actually um, have that aha moment where the light bulb goes off and goes, oh, I, I can share this and five other people can use it today. I think what I have learned the most about other people, specifically at F5, is how awesome the community can be when everybody is is going 100% on something. And that's something that I really feel that, um, as a company, we're doing here at F5. And honestly, I haven't seen this much buzz and excitement at F5 in a long time. All right. We thought we'd both give you some data on how do you sell the benefits of coaching to your organization, as well as some some uh, interviews and some anecdotes, if you will, from coaches and, and people who are being coached directly. Um, with that, I wonder if there are any questions in the chat. Yeah, you... um, and this aren't been, I think Libby asked a, a couple times, um, will you give some examples of a uh, how you measure the coach, you have some great examples of the, the coaching program, but any specifics on how you can tell if a coach is doing well? Yeah, there's a couple that I, we don't have the raw data at hand right now, but um, if you all reflect back to the whole license progression, um, one of the things that we find is the, the, the people who are showing up to coaching sessions with their coach typically tend to progress in their license advancement more rapidly than those who don't. So one of the things that we can look at from time to time is if a coach is helping advance people's license or if they might even be stuck themselves. Um, so if we see, say, a coach is two coaches, if we were to compare two coaches as an example and say one of them, their license progression is going swimmingly, they've got a huge contributor and publisher push, whereas another may be starting from scratch with, um, you know, 90 percent of their coaches being candidates or something like that. We'll check in on that data set every once in a while and look for, are those individuals advancing their license? So that's one of the techniques we use to Libby, to Libby's question. Great. And how about the F5 um, team who was monitoring chat? Were there ones that you couldn't answer and you want to bring up now? I saw so many answers going in, but sometimes they were in amongst others. So I figured that five team Mallory wouldn't have a good idea. 
I've got a really pragmatic question um, that is uh, very dry and boring, so I apologize for it, but it's pretty it's pretty basic. It seems like I love the multi-year story that you told, and I love the building and the and the reinvestment into coaching that you told, and I loved the ability to demonstrate ROI that you told. But I can't help but wonder that some someone in leadership had to sit down for fiscal 2016, fiscal 2017, fiscal 2018, fiscal 2019, fiscal 2020, and say, here's the budget I need. Here's the roles I need. Here's the headcount I need. And somebody on the other side of the conversation, whether it be a finance person or some other person in the leadership echelon saying, whoa, 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 wait a second. I thought coaches was a transitory thing. I thought coaches was a temporary thing. I thought we're going to invest to get this things up and spinning and then we can back off coaches. Like, how did you solve that financial argument? I don't know that we've totally solved it. Okay. Fair enough. To be honest. Um, and I think that it, you know, Kendall mentioned earlier on that, uh, you know, a lot of selling the ROI of a coaching program, uh, we sort of did without the ability to measure it. And, and so it took, the commitment from our leaders that uh, uh, that this is something that we were going to be able to be successful with, and and so we, you know, we didn't have these kinds of measurements at the time. To even if we knew about them, uh, I don't know that we had the ability to measure them at that time. Um, right. So uh, the over the years we've gotten better at measuring it, but it's a constant. Uh, it's a constant conversation. And uh, even in our own org, we have, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's always, I think, going to be this push to um, anytime time becomes a crunch, we, you revert back to what you know. And sure. you know, if case volume goes up, uh, you know, it's often going to be one of the first things that's talked about is, well, let's, uh, let's reduce the number of coaching hours. So we have more, more people and more time available. And I think it really comes back to those metrics that show the increase or the decrease in time to close for folks yep. participating in coaching, both as coaches and as learners. Uh, and, and that over time, those, it, those investments are paying dividends in, in, in real time that aren't all, that aren't always, uh, as tangible as something like, uh, you know, total, total number of cases closed and things like that. So got it. Well, in, in one of the other arguments that came up in an earlier conversation was the notion of if you were to compare this to a software engineering software development team, and we were implementing agile best practice methodologies, and we had full time scrum masters, nobody would question ripping and replacing the scrum masters as a, Precisely. as a, you know, so it's kind of like it is what it is, you know, for this unit of energy that you're going to budget for FY23, I'm going to produce this level of goodness. And what's in there is really up to the team to decide what's the right thing to do for this year, maybe. Precisely. Yes. Great story overall, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, and this is Arne Finnegan. We are uh, timing out. Uh, there are a few questions that came in at the end, um, but what we'll do, I'll go ahead and um, send that to Kendall and Dave, and I'll highlight those, and then we'll go ahead and get those um, answered, and we'll send the uh, the chat out, chat log out, as well as, again, we're going to send the presentation. So um, as uh, Kendall and Dave mentioned it was a leap of faith at F5, but hopefully you can leverage some of these tangible metrics to show how F5 is um, is taking advantage and getting the, uh, the the benefits of a coaching program as just a data point for you all. So, and then I will just do a quick little um, blog highlighting this. And so we'll get that out. We'll get the blog out, the, um, the chat log, the recording and the presentation. And we'll get that out all this uh, this week. And or or on Monday, so uh, fairly shortly. But thank you all so much, and thank you so much, uh, Dave and Kendall. Really appreciate all the time you took to put together this presentation and the excellent delivery. So thank you all, and you all have a great rest of the day. Thanks for having us, everybody.
Thanks, everybody.